Oh, we need an ambulance. What's wrong, ma'am? We just uh, we had someone that was in our house, evidently, and they stabbed somebody. Okay, somebody's inside the house now. I don't know. We heard. Are they bleeding? You see someone yes. bleeding? Someone is bleeding in our house. Okay, where's they bleeding from? Uh, I think he was. I think in the stomach. Female or male? It's a male. He's a friend of ours. He was, spent, he was spending the night with us. Shortly before midnight on August 2nd, 2006, an ambulance was called to a row house on Swan Street in Washington, D.C. The location was only about a mile away from the White House. Upon arrival, paramedics were greeted by one of the residents, Victor Saborski, who was still on the phone with the 911 operator. Bizarrely, Victor was dressed in a white dressing robe and appeared to have just bathed. Victor ushered the medics inside. They raced upstairs, past another man in a white robe by the name of Dylan Ward. The medics entered a bedroom. There, they found the body of 32-year-old Robert Wan lying upon a polite sofa bed. Standing over him was Joseph Price, who was dressed in nothing but his underwear. The paramedics quickly ascertained that Robert had been stabbed at least twice in the chest. On a nearby nightstand, they could see a bloody knife which they assumed to be the weapon with which Robert was attacked. Robert was rushed to the hospital but pronounced dead shortly after arrival. When detectives arrived at 1509 Swan Street, they tried to establish just what had happened. They found the patio door was ajar and their first inkling was that an intruder had murdered Robert in the course of a burglary. The house sat in an affluent area and would have been a prime target for any would-be thief. In the kitchen, they found a block of knife holders with one of the knives missing. It was possible that an intruder had entered through the patio door and immediately armed themselves before walking further into the house. However, suspicion soon fell upon the three men who lived at 1509 Swan Street. The property was owned by Joseph Price and Victor Saborski. Price was a prominent attorney, while Saborski had forged a successful career in marketing. Saborski was actually a part of the team that had come up with the famous Got Milk campaign. Dylan Ward also lived in the house and it emerged that the three men were in a polyamorous relationship. A female tenant also lived at the property but she was not present on the night in question. Robert Wan's reason for being at the house that night was the fact that he had been working late and rather than make the long trip back to Connecticut Avenue where he lived, Robert had arranged with Joseph Price to stay at his place for the night. Robert and Joseph had been old college buddies and Robert was told that he was more than welcome to stay over. Robert Wan had been a high flyer from a young age. After graduating as valedictorian from his high school, the fourth generation Chinese American attended the College of William and Mary on a full scholarship. During his freshman year, he met Joseph Price, who was a senior at the time. The two moved in the same circles and both were heavily involved in student government. In 1999, Robert graduated from the University of Pennsylvania's Law School. He spent several years working in real estate law and in 2003 Robert married Catherine. Around two months before his murder, Robert had taken up employment with Radio Free Asia, a non-profit organisation that broadcast independent news reports to areas of Asia with oppressive censorship laws. Following Robert's death, detectives called Joseph, Victor and Dylan in for questioning. They got straight to the point. The initial theory that an intruder had stabbed Robert was no longer the main line of inquiry. Certain aspects of the crime scene just didn't support the idea of a burglary gone wrong. To start with, the paramedics who had initially attended to Robert had been perplexed by the lack of blood. Having been stabbed three times, one would have expected there to be a great deal of blood on Robert's body, clothing, and the bedding he had been lying upon, but other than a thin layer of dry blood on his chest, there was little else to be found. The EMTs also remarked that they were disturbed 
with regard to how calm the three men were. Also, Robert's belongings, including his wallet, an expensive watch, and his cell phone, were sitting next to him on a bedside table. Surely a thief would have swiped these before fleeing the scene. Detectives got straight to the point. I have to be honest and fair with you. I don't believe it. We'll get the truth here. Everyone keeps telling me that. I don't know why. Well, because some one, one or more of you three stabbed this one. I don't believe that. I really can't believe that. When it was his turn to be interviewed, Joseph Price doubled down on the theory that an intruder had stabbed his friend. If, I mean, somebody jumped our fence and went through that door, you, you said tell you what, what I know. We have an alarm system. Was, the alarm was not on, but it has a, a function where the doors chime if you open the doors, whether the alarm or not. The, after Robert was there, we had drinks around the, you know, sink. Went upstairs, we showed Robert where the shower was, where the bathroom was, right down the hall. Here's your bed. We already made out the pull-out bed for him. Um, we said good night. He said he was going to take a shower <coughs> right then. It was all sticky. Um, I went upstairs, fin like, I saw the last five minutes of the show, and then started watching the first ten minutes of, like, some other thing on Spike TV, and I knew Victor was getting annoyed that I wasn't turning off the TV, so I turned it off and he went to sleep. Um, the next thing that I know, I hear the chime. It's two beeps, beep beep. You don't know what happened until you heard the chime? Right. I don't know what happened until I hear the chime. So you wasn't asleep when you heard it? I was asleep, but it wakes me up. There, there are two control units, one's in our bedroom. Right there in your bedroom. Yes, one's down on the first mm -hmm. floor. So I hear that. It doesn't concern me, it wakes me up, but I hear it and I think, oh, Sarah came home. Sarah's our tenant. She looks down in the basement. She had said to us, oh, I'm going to go to Tommy John's tonight. I might come back, I might not. She occasionally does that. They have a guest room to just crash there. Um, I thought she came home. No problem. She's very heavy. She doesn't come upstairs. I wasn't worried, like, oh, she's going to come find Robert and have a cow or anything. I mean, she just come in and go downstairs. I don't know how long it was from when I heard the chime. It was not long enough for me to go back to sleep. And I hear what, what is, you know, it, it was yelling, but it wasn't, it was just like grunts or something. But you don't know how long it was. I don't know how long it was, but it, it was not. The two detectives asked a series of sexually charged questions. They seemed to be struggling with the idea that Robert, a straight and happily married man, was staying over in a house with three gay men. This guy's perfectly straight, and he's gonna leave his wife for the night and come over to y'all's house. Yeah, because he's, he's not perfectly straight. That's I not something a straight guy would do. He was working late, he was probably taking the metro, and he didn't want to go all the way back up to Virginia. You know how long it takes to get from downtown to Virginia? Less time than it takes to get in a cab from downtown to Swan Street. So that doesn't... I never view. questioned it. I just figured, oh, okay, that's fine. But I'm telling you, because I, that, is, that is what I do. I question it. With no concrete evidence that either Joseph, Dylan, or Victor had stabbed Robert to death, the three men were free to go, but not before providing detectives with DNA samples. They were still the main suspects for Robert's murder. Joseph had initially told detectives that he had picked up the bloody knife as it was resting on Robert's torso. But in the days after the murder, he informed a friend that he had physically pulled the weapon from Robert's chest. It might seem like an inconsequential detail, but it's difficult to understand how a person could forget pulling a knife from the body of another human being. I mean, it's not something that a person does every day. It was then discovered that the bloody knife uncovered at the scene was actually unlikely to be the murder weapon. Robert's wounds and the shape of the blade 
just didn't match up. It was also determined that Robert would have lived for between 1 to 10 minutes after receiving the three stab wounds that would ultimately cost him his life. Yet he was found lying in bed. One would imagine that he would have been frantically rushing around, begging for somebody to help him. This, coupled with the total lack of blood found on Robert's person on the sofa bed, meant that detectives were now entertaining the idea that Robert had been stabbed to death elsewhere in the house before being washed and placed in bed. In the weeks following the murder of Robert Wan, investigators practically tore apart the house on Swan Street. Everything from sections of flooring, walls and even sinks were dismantled and sent away for forensic analysis. Detectives also found out that shortly after the police arrived on the scene, Joseph had told one of the officers a very different story to the one he would tell down at the station. Joseph had supposedly told one of the cops that after hearing a scream while lying in bed, he had rushed downstairs to find Robert on the other side of the patio door, bleeding profusely and asking for help. Joseph stated that he and Victor and Dylan had laid Robert upstairs to lay down on the sofa bed. The three men had then been told to wait in the living room while paramedics worked on Robert. They were observed whispering amongst themselves and detectives now suspected that they had been getting their stories straight before they were interviewed separately. Detectives also noticed while going through the home just how loudly their footsteps sounded when they walked up the wooden stairs. They found it implausible that an intruder could have climbed these stairs without being heard by at least one resident. As Joseph and Victor were sleeping together on the third floor of the house, it made some sense that they never heard the killer. However, Dylan's room had to be passed in order to reach the home office where Robert was staying. Joseph suggested that the compressor from the home's air conditioning unit might have drowned out the sound of the intruder's footsteps and the subsequent assault upon Robert. When detectives put the air conditioning on for themselves and stood in Dylan's room, they determined that the noise was hardly even noticeable. When asked why the patio door had been left unlocked, Joseph gave an answer that to this day many find to be too ridiculous to be believed. According to Joseph, he had been downstairs in the kitchen when something outside grabbed his attention. When he went outside to investigate, Joseph said that it was just a spider crawling along one of the patio lights. Joseph stated that he had unlocked the door, but forgot to relock it again before going to bed. During their investigation, detectives called in a police dog trained to detect the presence of blood. The three defendants had been adamant that Robert was murdered while in bed, but the cadaver dog's analysis would paint a different picture. When laid through the house, the dog made a beeline for the patio door and was laid outside. The dog made its way to a drain and alerted its handler that it could detect blood. Inside the house, the dog detected the presence of blood at a clothes dryer next to Dylan's room. Police guessed that the killer or killers hosed down their clothing next to the drain pipe before drying their clothes in the laundry room. However, no clothing was recovered. Using a special chemical known as luminol, which actually glows when it comes into contact with blood, detectives were also able to find trace amounts of blood in and around where Robert's body had been found. They were now of the opinion that a cleaning operation had taken place immediately after Robert's murder. If this was true, then it was even less likely that an intruder had killed Robert. A search of Dylan Ward's room uncovered a trove of BDSM material including chains, shackles, restraints and whips. Dylan openly admitted to being in a sadomasochistic relationship with Joseph, with Dylan being the dominant partner. Meanwhile, an autopsy of Robert Wan's body uncovered the presence of semen. The detectives had already suspected that Robert had been sexually assaulted before being murdered. 
Naturally, investigators had the semen analysed and were confident that the results would point towards one of the three men who lived in the row house. However, when the results came back, it was revealed that the semen was Robert's. Detectives were dumbfounded, but their attention was then drawn to yet another item located in Dylan's room, a bizarre sex toy that uses electricity to involuntarily induce ejaculation in another man. Was this device used on Robert against his will? Puncture marks were also found on several locations on Robert's body and it was suggested that he might have been injected with something that paralysed him. Investigators also uncovered a three-piece cutlery box set in Dylan's room. Only two knives were present in the box though. Detectives were already of the opinion that the bloody knife found in Robert's room on the night of his death was not the murder weapon. Could the missing knife have been the one used to kill Robert? They reached out to the manufacturers who sent them an exact duplicate. The length of the blade on the small cutlery knife was found to be 4.5 inches, which was the exact depth of the stab wounds Robert had received to his chest. The investigation moved at a slow pace. Detectives had all but discarded the theory that an unknown intruder had murdered Robert. But then, three months after Robert's death, 1509 Swan Street was indeed burgled by none other than Joseph Price's brother. Michael Price had a history of drug addiction. He stole $7,000 worth of electrical items from his older brother's house and was apprehended when the stolen goods started showing up in local pawn shops. Michael's partner told police that thanks to his drug habit, he was prone to bouts of anger and outbursts of violence. At the time, Michael was a nursing student who would have had access to multiple drugs that cause paralysis. And perhaps most peculiarly, Michael had skipped a night class on the date of Robert's murder despite having an exemplary attendance record. Was it possible that Michael Price was the real killer? Had the three housemates in actual fact stumbled across the murder and cleaned up the scene in order to protect Joseph and his brother? Suddenly, the intruder theory had newfound credibility. However, things would move slowly. A year passed and then another without any arrests being made. Robert's wife, Catherine, held a press conference on the first anniversary of her husband's death, hoping to keep Robert in the public eye. Her attorney pleaded with Joseph, Victor and Dylan, urging them to come forward and tell the police everything they knew, the implication being that they had not told detectives everything they knew about what happened that night. No charges were ever brought against Michael Price, for Robert's murder. However, in 2008, the three housemates were charged with obstruction of justice and conspiracy. At their trial, Joseph, Victor and Dylan pleaded their Fifth Amendment rights and refused to give evidence. Perhaps worried that the weight of public opinion had turned against them, the trio also opted for a non-jury trial. Prosecutors didn't outright accuse either man of having carried out the murder but they argued that all had taken part in a cleanup operation. Their reason for doing so was supposedly to protect the family, i.e. themselves. Victor, Dylan and Joseph's lawyers argued that the cops investigating the case had been blindsided by the men's sexualities and the investigation had been inherently flawed from the beginning. The judge spent over an hour explaining that she believed at least one of the three men did know who had killed Robert Wan, but stated that she was not convinced they were guilty of the charges they were accused of collectively. Judge Le Beaufitz further stated that she was fairly certain Robert hadn't been murdered by any intruder. In 2008, Robert's widow filed a wrongful death suit against Joseph, Dylan and Victor. The case was settled out of court for an undisclosed sum. As of June 2023, nobody has ever been charged with Robert's murder, 
but many people, myself included, are of the opinion that either Joseph, Dylan, Victor, or quite possibly all three know very well what happened that night.